title, as you can see on the screens, is The Supremacy of Christ. The supremacy. He is supreme. Another way to say that would, might be the preeminency, the preeminent, the most important, the highest is Jesus Christ. And so a little bit about Colossae. It may or may not help us here. Uh, Colossae uh, was 100 miles from Ephesus. And uh, so there's this, this group of three cities. I'll show you a map in a little bit here. But, but uh, Colossae was near Laodicea. You may have, that may ring a bell because Laodicea, Jesus wrote a church to, uh, or he wrote a letter to the Laodiceans there in, in uh, Revelation. So, and then the other city is Hierapolis. So you have Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis are, are all next to each other. Uh, it seems that, uh, uh, well, actually, if you look at Colossians, if you have it open and you flip to the very last chapter and you read uh, uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Epaphras, who is one of you, so he was a member of this church in Colossae, and a servant of Christ Jesus sends greetings. So Epaphras went from Colossae to Rome. Paul was writing this from in prison in Rome. So Epaphras was there with Paul in Rome. Uh, we'll read the rest of that verse later. But then if you jump down to verse 13, I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. So these were these three cities. So evidently there were three churches. And Epaphras could have been the pastor of all these three churches. Colossae, Hierapolis, and Laodicea. You know, back in the olden days, right? Circuit preachers. And you might have one pastor that's pastoring five or six churches in little towns. And they'd go and they'd minister to all these different congregations. Well, this could be Epaphras where he's ministering in Colossae, but also in Hierapolis and Laodicea. Laodicea will m might mention uh, more about that. In New Testament times, though, Laodicea and Hierapolis were a bit more prominent. They were a bit more kind of the, more the, the bigger, more economical uh, cities. And then Colossae would be the third on the list there of those three cities. And we don't have any record of Paul ever visiting Colossae. Isn't that interesting? He's writing a letter to them, but uh, we don't think that he ever visited them. Of course, he did spend three years in Ephesus, but again, 100 miles back then, was a lot more than today, right? A hundred miles, we could just jump in the car and be there. Well, some of you could be there in an hour because <laughs> you drive so fast. But for me, it would take me two hours. No, I'm just, it would take me, let me see, going, s well, you could be there in a couple hours, right? Uh, we'll just leave it at that. Um, uh, but we know that, that in Acts chapter 19, it says that all those in Ephesus all those in the area, it says, they heard the word of the Lord. All those that lived in the area heard the word of the Lord. And, uh, and so it could be that Epaphras may have heard Paul speak in Ephesus. And then he went back home to Colossae and he shared what he heard. And maybe he birthed the church there. Maybe he was the church planter. Epaphras, we don't, we don't really know. Um, I also mentioned that that Paul was in prison, and so, uh, of course, he wrote Ephesians, Philippians, uh, Colossians, and then he also wrote Philemon uh, there while he was in Rome. Uh, um, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 7, so we'll flip over to 1, verse 7, you see it says, you learned it, and talking about the gospel, we'll, we'll read the first verses here in a minute, but it says, you learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the spirit. And so, so here Paul says that the Colossians learned about the gospel from Epaphras. So it seems that Epaphras was the pastor, or at least a very influential person uh, who uh, led many people there to Jesus, who took the gospel to the believers in Colossae. And, and no doubt now as he returns to Rome, he's telling Paul, about the church and, and what happened there. Well, one of the things that Epaphras told uh, the believers at Colossae is there was there's some doctrinal error, some problems happening in uh, the church there that was being introduced. Uh, the Colossians were starting to believe things that weren't the gospel. They weren't true. So there was heresy. Uh, heresy is like a teaching that denies one of the central tenets of Christianity. Uh, for example, a heresy would be that Jesus is not God. That's a heretical teaching. You know, a heresy would be Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, that that was just a ghost or an apparition. These, these different things, right, would be heretical. 
And so um, uh, the, the heresy that was endangering the church there in Colossae was what is often called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism, just I want you to hear the word no in that, like Gnostics, no. They were uh, the people that had this self-professed superior knowledge. They were in the know, quote unquote. Uh, and so they, what, what was happening, and, and Bible scholars don't really know all of the details here with, with what was happening in Colossae, but we could say, uh, based on what Paul's writing here, that they were blending Christian truth with legalism, uh, with different philosophical uh, teachings, and also maybe some Eastern mysticism. So it's this syn syncretic or this syncretistic uh, viewpoint that they're starting to believe that it's not just Jesus that saves you, but Jesus and then these other, these other teachings. Uh, for example, the Gnostics taught that all matter was evil. So all matter was evil, uh, including the human body. Uh, so it would be evil. Anything materialistic would be evil. And since God could not come in contact with matter, since Christ had a human body, uh, Christ was simply an emanation, right? Just, just an, an, he wasn't really God in the flesh. He wasn't really the Son of God. This would be a Gnostic teaching. And so then they were saying, in order to be saved, then you would have to have this superior knowledge. You, in other words, you'd have to become like one of them. Anytime you have a group that says you have to become one of us, otherwise you're not saved, you can uh, pretty much bet that you should not become one of them, right? Now, as obviously, we think as Christians, or we believe as Christians, that you must become a Christian to be saved, right? You must, you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You must have faith in the cross of Christ and, and accept the gospel. But never would we ever say you have to be part of our church to be saved, or you have to be part of Calvary Chapel to be saved, or, or you have to be part of our group to be saved. That would be, that would be a heresy. That would be uh, an absolute heresy. Okay, so anytime you add something to Jesus in order to be saved, you're uh, leaning into false, false teaching. Uh, and so Colossians helps us to seek the supremacy of Christ. And, and again, I just want us tonight to be focused on Christ, to be enamored with him, uh, to, be, to be so familiar with him that you don't fall prey to false teaching. And, and it seems that that's what Paul's doing because in, in this first chapter, he's, he, just, he just raises up Christ and he describes who Jesus is. He, he, he provides this beautiful picture of who Jesus is and then he starts addressing the heresy. So it's like as if he's saying, if you know the true Christ, if you know the real Christ, if you know my Jesus, the better you know Jesus, the better equipped you are to say no to the false teachings. You've probably have heard the illustration of a bank teller that becomes so familiar with touching real currency that as soon as they touch false currency, they know it immediately because they're so familiar with the authentic uh, currency. All right, and so, so Paul's going to, to deal with false teaching here. But let me share with you the main idea of, uh, of the book of Colossians. And here it is. Uh, because Jesus is fully God, supreme over all creation, and he's reconciled the world to himself, he's head of the church, he should be followed wholeheartedly above any other belief system or worldview. Because Jesus is fully God, supreme over all creation, and because he's reconciled the world to himself, and he's the head of the church, he should be followed wholeheartedly above any other belief system or worldview. So that's what's happening here in Colossians. Simple outline of the book. Uh, chapter 1 is doctrinal. It's about Christ's supremacy declared. Uh, chapter 2 is uh, danger, Christ's supremacy defended. That's where Paul deals with these different heresies. And then chapters three and four is about duty, Christ's supremacy demonstrated. All right, so let's look at chapter one then, Christ's supremacy declared. Colossians chapter one, verse one. Paul, an apostle of Christ, Jesus, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. 
to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. So, so verse 1, you have Paul's identity, and verse 2, you have the church's identity. Paul knew who he was. He's an apostle. He knew his calling. He knew what he was called to do. He knew it was the will of God. There's a prayer later in this chapter that talks about the will of God. Uh, and, then, and then he tells the church's identity, holy and faithful. Holy and faithful. That's what I want to be. I want to be holy and faithful. To the holy and faithful brothers and sisters we could add in Christ at Colossae. Then again, the very, very typical Paul here, grace and peace to you from God our Father. Uh, Verse 3, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. Do you see faith, hope, and love there? In verse 5, it says, The faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven, uh, and that you've heard about, I'm sorry, and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel. And so here we have faith, hope, and love, uh, which is, of course, mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right? Faith, hope, and love, these three supreme realities of our Christian faith. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest is love right the greatest of these is love faith hope and love and then verse six that has come to you all over the world the known world at that time this gospel is producing fruit and growing that's the natural result brothers and sisters of the gospel produces fruit and it grows and it spreads just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood god's grace in all its truth. Do you remember the day you heard the gospel and, and the day subsequent? Have you grown just by the gospel? Have you grown by reading your Bible and by understanding the gospel and understanding Jesus? Are you closer to Jesus now than you were six months ago? Are you? Are you closer to Jesus now than you were two or three years ago? I hope so. If you're not, you can switch that and you can start getting closer. And, and Paul says here, you, you, you grow. This is the natural result of the gospel. The gospel produces fruit. Often we can hinder that, right? There's a number of things in our life that can hinder it. Complaining, bitterness, sin, complacency, right? These things can hinder the growth in our lives, but the natural result of the gospel is growth. And then it, we already read verse 7, talking about Epaphras. And then verse 9 and let me tell you this, verse, uh, verse 9 to 12, uh, this is one of Paul's prayers. But there's something unique about this prayer, and that is that it's my favorite Pauline prayer. <laughs> this is absolutely, in my opinion, uh, one of the most uh, beautiful, impactful prayers in all of Scripture. This is a prayer, and I don't know what it is, but it just resonates with me. And if you want to pray for me, uh, just open your Bible to Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, and just pray this for me. You should pray this for yourself as well, but this this is just so good. This is so good. He says, for the reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. Paul was a praying man. He was a praying man. And here, here's his prayer for the Colossians. It says, asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Do you want to know God's will? God, I pray that you would give me the knowledge of your will. Show me your will, Lord. Reveal your will to me. Give me spiritual wisdom and understanding. This is, this is maturity. He's praying for the ability to to think deeply about about Bible truth, to understand Scripture and to to understand who God is. This comes through prayer. You can't grow. You can't grow in wisdom unless there's prayer. You can't know God's will unless there's prayer. Verse 10, and we pray this, why? In order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. So you have to know God's will. 
You have to have spiritual wisdom and understanding. You have to be filled with God's will in order that you could live a life worthy of Him. Lord, I want to live a life worthy of You. I want to please You in every way. I want to bear fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. So, so Paul, I mean, you, Paul seems to know the Lord so well. And, and he, he just seems like it in, in one or two sentences, and, and we'll see that as, as we go through here, that, that we literally could spend our entire time just reading over this prayer and, and meditating upon it and, and thinking deeply about it. <laughs> you know, Paul just wrote it. zippity doo da, <laughs> zippity ace, And, and it just, just the, the, the theological depth in this man because he was a man of prayer and he spent time with the Lord. But I, 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 like, I, I love what he's praying about, bearing fruit in every good work. Lord, I want to bear fruit. I, I don't want to waste time. I don't want to spend time doing something that doesn't prosper the kingdom of God. You know what I mean? That doesn't, that doesn't advance the kingdom of God. Being strengthened with all power. Now look at this verse 11. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. Okay, how many of you want to be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might? Strengthened with all power. I mean, this sounds like, like a superhero or a weightlifter. Why do you need to be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might? It's, uh, I mean, well, it tells you right there. It's not what you think, right? It's not what initially you would think. Why do I need to be strong so I can stand in front of groups of people and proclaim the gospel? No, why, why do you need to be strong? So that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father. So it seems like we need to be strengthened with power and might so that we can endure and be patient because we go through suffering and we go through difficulty and we go through times of trials that require us to endure and to be patient. And we need to pray for strength to endure to be patient. Verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. So God has qualified you to be with him, to inherit heaven. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into or conveyed us into the kingdom of the son he loves. And so he's rescued you. He's rescued you from the dominion of darkness. And the world is getting so dark. There's such evil in the world today. There's so much violence and hate and animosity and pride. And he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness. This, this dark world does not control us. It does not dictate what we, what we do or how we act. Verse 14, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So this is Paul's wonderful prayer. And now, uh, the rest, uh, well, not the, yeah, well, maybe the rest, uh, f at least from verse, verse 15 to verse 20 here, even farther than that, we have this, uh, this fantastic description of Christ. So let, let's read this. He is the image or the essence of the invisible God. So this is who Jesus is now. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So Jesus revealed God to man. If you want to know what God looks like, you look at Jesus. If you want to know how God acts, you look at how Jesus acted. If you want to know how God loves people, you look at Jesus. If you want to know how much God cares about people, look at what Jesus did. If you want to know the power of God, look at Jesus. He is the image, the essence of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. And so, so uh, this word can throw you off a little bit. 
You say, well, Jesus was born first. Is that what firstborn means? That he's born first? And it does not mean that he was born first. It's a word that uh, implies preeminence or supremacy. Uh, it is the firstborn over creation, not the firstborn of creation. The Greek word that Paul's using here for firstborn is a prototokos. Now, you don't have to know the Greek word at all, but if, 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 uh, if Paul was saying Jesus was the first one created, that would be a different word. Uh, there are uh, groups that are heretical groups um, that take this passage and they distort it, saying that Jesus is a created being. They'll say, see there, Colossians 1 for 1 15, Jesus was born first. And they'll say, God created Jesus. Uh, but this is, this is not uh, what that means. Firstborn over creation means that Jesus preceded creation. He was before creation and he's sovereign over all creation. Um, so it's not a word of chronology, but it's a word of priority. It's a word of authority. Uh, verse 16, it says, For by him all things were created. So Jesus created all things. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Okay, so has anybody here ever been a Jehovah's Witness? Yeah. So, so I, I spent, I, I was never a Jehovah's Witness, but I spent some time when I lived in Nashville. I uh, spent some time with a Jehovah's Witness. He knocked on my door one time. I invited him in, in, invited him in started, th and I was, I was a solid Christian. I mean, I was a believer. But I, I thought that I could share the love of the Lord and with this individual. So I invited him, hi him in, and, and we chatted, and then we made an appointment that he'd come back next week. And, uh, and so I spent all of my time, and it was obviously before I was married and before I had kids and, and all of that, but I, I tracked down somebody that knew a lot about Jehovah Witnesses because I wanted to be able to engage him, and I wanted to have a plan, and I, I didn't want to just get into arguments, you know, back and forth. I really wanted to, to lead this guy to the Lord. I really, really did. And, uh, and so I, I, I found a man who had this ministry to Jehovah Witnesses, and we talked on the phone, and, and he, you know, shared things with me, and, and he encouraged me to meet with him every week, and then every week bring up one piece of information that would introduce doubt into, into what he believes and just begin to develop a relationship with him. And, uh, and we started with this, with this passage right here. Uh, so the Jehovah Witnesses have a translation of the Bible, their own translation of the Bible, and it's called the New World Translation. Uh, now, you would be uh, very hard-pressed to find a Greek scholar that would, because uh, um, they have a Greek translation of the, the New Testament, and their Greek translation, you would be very hard-pressed to find a Greek scholar, a legitimate Greek scholar, that would say it's a good translation. Any Greek scholar that understands the language would, would see that they have messed with the text. But they do have a, uh, a book that shows the Greek and the English. Right? So it shows their Greek from the New World Translation and then their English from the New World Translation. And, and if you opened that book, it's called an interlinear because it's showing Greek and English in a line, right? It's showing Greek on, one, on the bottom and English on the top or, or vice versa. And if you were to open that book to Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, and you'd look at, you'd look at uh, the, the English, uh, well, first of all, the New Testament in the New World Translation, it reads like this, uh, for by him... All other things were created. Uh, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all other things were created by him and for him. He is, well, I, I'm reading from the NIV here, but 
but they, they inserted the word other about five or six times in these several verses. But what's very interesting, if you look at their Greek text, and you can see what word is translated from Greek to English, there's no word in their Greek text that's translated other. So even in their own document, you can see this. And so one of the, one of the questions that this man suggested I ask my new friend is, uh, is, I've heard that you believe Jesus is a thing. Is that correct? And they'll say, well, no, we don't believe Jesus is a thing. I say, well, can you explain a, vi a Bible verse to me then? And then you open up their translation. Say it says, Jesus, uh, that all other things were created. So if other things were created by him, then he himself has to be a thing. And so that was, that was uh, my introduction into the world of uh, the New World Translation and, and Jehovah Witnesses. And I did meet with him every week. And, and uh, so I'd meet with him. And I'd always have my little agenda that I received from this gentleman that was coaching me through this. Uh, and, and, uh, but unfortunately, uh, he never accepted the Lord. So and we lost touch. Um, but, but I learned a lot in that time. So, Okay, so of course, though, this passage, what it truly says is that Jesus created everything. He created things in heaven and things on earth. He created visible things and invisible things, such as angels, uh, thrones, powers, rulers, authorities. All things were created by Jesus and for Jesus. You were created for Jesus. Of course, we know John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the word was God. And so this is, this is the preeminency, the supremacy of Christ. This is such a powerful passage. Colossians 1.17 says, He is before all things. He is, so he he's precedes all things. He's the head of all things. He has authority. And in him, all things hold together. I don't know if we have any physicists among us uh, or people that understand uh, molecules and protons and neutrons. I don't know if anybody understands these things. I don't. Uh, but I'm told, I'm told that 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 nobody really knows what keeps these atoms together. Is that right? Has you have you heard that before? That nobody really knows. No scientist can really give an adequate explanation. How come these protons and neutrons and atoms? How come how come they don't just how it, they don't just all come apart. But Colossians chapter 1 tells us here, it says that Jesus holds all things together. And I love verse 18. He is the head of the church. He's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. On our staff page, on our website, we should put the head of the church, Jesus. He is the head of the church. We want to follow Jesus. We want to be on his agenda. He is the beginning of, and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. And this right here, Colossians 1.18, is the key verse for the entire book of Colossians. He is the head of the body, the church. Jesus, you are the head of us. You are the head of our church, Lord. You are the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead. Lord, we want you to have the supremacy. Lord, we want to live for you. Uh, in verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. So all the fullness of God dwelt in Jesus. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And so we're reconciled to God. Paul goes on, verse 21, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Amen. Enemies of God. Uh, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death. And notice Paul emphasizes his physical body because he knows the Gnostics are saying that Jesus didn't really have a physical body. It was just an appearance of a physical body. Uh, to present you holy in his sight, take joy, brothers and sisters, without blemish and free from accusation. Do you understand one day you're going to be 
before God, holy without blemish, free from accusation. Free from accusation. Anybody here ever done anything wrong? Could we accuse you of anything? Yes, of course, right? You could accuse me of doing wrong things. But when you stand before God in heaven, you are free from accusation. It, 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 it's like you have not offended God. You've done nothing wrong without blemish. You've done nothing wrong. That we often hear that today, and we know people, people do things wrong. I haven't done anything wrong. In fact, I, 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 I saw this headline, and I was aghast. I, I was, it was almost unbelievable. It's from uh, a couple of weeks ago. Perhaps you saw it too. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was the, the killer in Uvalde. His mother said something like, please don't judge my son. He must have had a reason for what he did. And, I, and I, I didn't read the article, but I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Hey, he, he's, he's, you know, he must. So, so now we know, right, bad parenting. That's bad parenting. In my, op- well, not even in my opinion. That's just flat out bad parenting. And, and so, so, so what she's saying is like, don't accuse him. He must have had a reason. He's, he's free from accusation. He didn't do anything wrong because wrong is relative. That seems like that's kind of what's, what's happening there. Um, but but in, in biblical truth, because Jesus has paid the price for all of our sin when we stand before God. This, I, I never get tired of talking about this. And I know you've heard me talk about it more than once. Is that when we stand in heaven, Jesus, we're, we're without blame. This uh, brings up the, that last couple verses in Jude, which is one of my favorite passages of Scripture, right? Now, to him who is able uh, to present you faultless, faultless before the throne, right? Ah, uh, so good, so good. And so, so this passage here, without blemish and free from accusation, if, it's conditional, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. Okay, so this is important. It says that we are, we are free from accusation without, without blemish if we continue in our faith. Well, wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible teach once saved, always saved? Well, some would say yes. Others would say no. Doesn't the Bible teach that once you pray and ask Jesus into your life, into your heart, that, that now you are saved and, and no matter what you do, you're, you're still going to be before his throne without fault and with blemish or, or without blemish and without fault, free from accusation? Well, this verse says that that is true if you continue in your faith. So let, let me ask you a question. Will you be presented before the throne of Christ without blemish and free from accusation if you don't continue in your faith, if you walk away from the Lord, if you're not established and firm, if, if, you, if you're not, if, if, you, if you chuck the gospel and, you, and you, you blaspheme the Lord? Well, that's a question that scholars debate. I, where I want to be, why would you want to, right? Why would you not want to continue in your faith? Let's just be sure. And let's just continue in our faith, established and firm. We'll leave the debates to the, you know, the people that are a lot smarter than us, all the theologians. Um, and that, you know, people take, in summary, there's, there's godly people on both sides of the issue. And there's, there's, there's you know, biblical verses that are used to support both of those extremes. Um, But uh, let's just read the word and let's continue in the faith. Let's be established and firm. And then we can know for sure that when we're presented in heaven with Christ, we will be holy and blameless without accusation. Then verse 24 um, well, the end of uh, verse 23, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. We are servants of the gospel. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant 
by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but now is disclosed to the saints. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you. And so, of course, a mystery in the Bible is something that was concealed in the Old Testament and revealed in the New Testament. And so this mystery that Paul is talking about is, is, is uh, Jesus Christ living within me, living within you. Uh, so uh, in the Old Testament, of course, people walked by faith and they worshiped God. But in the New Testament now, God imbibes, abides within us. Jesus lives within us. Whether you're Gentile or Jew, it doesn't matter. Uh, we all receive these glorious riches of Christ in us. Uh, we proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. And so this fantastic mission statement here for Paul, the Apostle Paul. This is his vision. This is what he wanted to do. He wanted to disciple people. He wanted to teach them. He wanted to exhort and admonish them and teach them God's word so that, so that everyone that under, under his tutelage, under his teaching, would grow up and become mature in Christ. This is discipleship. The more you get into God's word, the more you fellowship with believers, the more you talk about God's word and think about it and, and practice it and live it out and take steps of faith, the more you will become what Paul writes here, perfect in Christ. Of course, we never reach that perfection on this side of eternity, uh, but we are, working, we are working towards that. And then chapter 2, he says, I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you and for all those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. So this seems to indicate that maybe he never went to Colossae, never went to Laodicea. My purpose is that they may be encouraged we talked about encouragement last Sunday. Encourage you to encourage you to go back and check out that message if you need some encouragement. Uh, that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding. This is just so deep. In order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We just have to read that again. Verse 2, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I pray that you would seek Christ. Spend time with him. You know, his riches are unsearchable. You'll never get to the point in this life where you can't get closer to God and you can't know him more. I think sometimes as we've walked with the Lord for many years and as, as we get older and the years tick on, that sometimes we can fall into a bit of complacency and we can say, yeah, I've been there, I've done that, I know that, I, I know enough Jesus to get through life now and all that. But, and, and I get that completely. I, I, that's a danger to me for sure. But, but this book here, especially it's in Colossians, that, uh, that we can search the unsearchable riches of Christ and, and get close to him. And now he gets into this uh, defense here of defending, uh, defending against these dangers, uh, against Christ's su supremacy. And he says in verse 4, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. He's saying you can, everything you need, you can seek in Christ. You don't have to seek all these other belief systems. You don't have to run around the world and, and investigate Hinduism and, and Buddhism and, and Islam and, and all of these other, everything you need, you can find in Christ. Every spiritual truth you can find in Christ. He says, I tell you this so that no one may, may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. And uh, these, these are a couple good memory verses for you here. Uh, Colossians 2, 6, and 7. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with 
thankfulness. And so these are verses of growth. You should be growing as a Christian, being rooted, being built up, uh, getting into God's word, digging into it, searching the scriptures. Uh, Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. You know, I've, I've used this verse to talk to young people about dating because I think that dating is a human tradition, a basic principle of the world. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of principles in the world that we could expose uh, that, are, that can be deceptive and hollow, human tradition. Uh, we need to make sure that we're seeking Christ and not being taken captive by the latest and greatest out in the world. There's so many fine-sounding arguments and fine-sounding philosophies and new waves of this and new waves of that that have little, if anything, to do with Christ. And we don't need to be taken captive with any of that. And I I love Paul's warning here. And verse 9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. All, this, is, this verse is about the deity of Christ. All the fullness of the deity lives in Christ in bodily form. Jesus is God. I will never apologize for that. I will never back down from that truth. Jesus is God. God. All the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. There are just too many scriptures that defend this truth of the deity of Christ to ever uh, not believe it. And it says, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature. So he's talking about a spiritual circumcision, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, so that that cut off, our flesh has been cut off, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God. So we're having a baptism June 26th. Uh, If you haven't been baptized yet, I encourage you to go to our website and sign up, watch a video there, fill out a form, and love to celebrate that important day with you, important step in your walk with the Lord. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Paul's talking about the law. Paul's talking about This written code of the law, the regulations, the rules. Do this. You have to do this. You can't do that. You must do this. If you do this, you have to do this. Having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And so, again, talking about the supremacy of Christ over the law, over rules, over religion. It's all about Jesus. Verse 16, Therefore, Because of who Jesus is, what he has done, how he set us free. Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink. So this is important. Uh, If you're a vegetarian or a vegan, praise the Lord. That's wonderful. If you eat meat, praise the Lord. That's wonderful. But don't, if you, if you eat meat, don't think bad of vegetarians And if you're a vegetarian, don't think bad of those who eat meat. Let no one judge you. Don't judge anybody based on what they eat or what they drink. Or with regard to a religious festival. You know, if if some people don't celebrate Christmas, hey, we have freedom in Christ not to do that. I knew a brother that never got a Christmas tree, but he put up a cross in his house. He's free in Christ to put up a cross. We get a Christmas tree. You shouldn't judge me for getting a tree, and I won't judge you for not getting a tree, and vice versa, right? We shouldn't judge each other for religious festivals, right? If people go to church on Saturday and they go, you know, to the beach on Sunday, 
you're free to do that. You know, I'm not going to judge you for not doing that. Of course, we don't have a Saturday service, so you have to come on Sunday here. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. You know, we don't judge each other on these things. We're free in Christ. We have freedom in Christ. Just don't use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature, right? You don't say, well, I have freedom not to go to church, so I'm going to go indulge my sinful nature, and I'm going to, you know, go watch things I shouldn't do and party and, and do all of these things and give no place for God in my life. If that's what you're doing, well, then I should judge you, and I should have you come back to church and get back into fellowship. Uh, verse 17, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. And so this would be somebody in, in this culture, one of these Gnostics that's talking about uh, this revealed higher truth about the immaterial world is not evil, but the material world is evil. And, and so I'm going to abstain as much as I can from, from all of these things so that I can be holy. We might, we might compare this to somebody who, who, uh, who, who just is, is radically abstaining from, from all of these different things because they don't want to be corrupted. You know, maybe like I'm thinking of somebody like in a monastery or, or whatever, whatever it might be. And, and Paul says here that this could result in this false humility. I'm doing all of these spiritual things, and now I have this, this humility because I think I'm better than everybody else who doesn't do these things. You know, I get up at 3 a.m., and I spend two hours in prayer every day, and so now, and I'm not, that's not a true statement. I'm using an illustration, okay? But let's just say that, you know, oh, I get up at 3 a.m., and I spend two hours in prayer. And then at 5, I start reading my Bible, and I read until 8 o'clock. I mean, so, so if, if this is, if, and if, if these are my spiritual practices, now all of a sudden because I do this and I know nobody else does it, now all of a sudden I have this false humility. I, I, I think I'm humble because I'm doing all of these things, but it's a false humility. Paul uses worshiping angels says, verse 19, he has lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. I, I, I'm seeking all of this, this spiritual truth in all of these places and, and, I'm, and I'm practicing spiritual disciplines just for the sake of spiritual disciplines, not to draw near to God, but just so I can feel better than everybody else and be more spiritual than other people. So now, I've lost connection with the very one that these spiritual disciplines are supposed to connect me with. Does that make sense? Verse 20, since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why as though you still belong to it? Do you submit to its rules? Don't handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship their false humil humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. That's why some of the greatest, quote-unquote, greatest spiritual leaders of our time have been found to be frauds and have been found to be sin very sinful people. All right, chapter 3. Here's, here's now what Paul says. Instead of doing all of that, here's what you should do. So this is the third section. This is the, that duty section. How we demonstrate that Christ is supreme in our lives. I, I've memorized these verses here, Colossians 3, 1 to 4, because they're so useful. They are so, so useful in life. Since then, you've been raised with Christ Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. You know, listen, our minds are so powerful and our thoughts can be so destructive and our, our thoughts can just corrupt us. Our thoughts can make us 
fearful. Our thoughts can destroy our identity. Our thoughts can be so damaging to us and to others. And so, so this is why I think these verses are so useful. Uh, so when, when you're struggling with, with your thoughts, that since then you have been raised with Christ. This is the truth. You've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Folks, I think we need to get back to memorizing Scripture. Not so that we can feel, have a sense of false humility, you know, but just so that we can empower ourselves to be closer with the Lord. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, and you also appear to him in glory. I'll, I'll mention, I'll talk about that in a second. But I, I ran across um, this whole, this whole, this whole thought, uh, this whole concept here of, of of setting our minds on a certain place and and controlling our thoughts. I think is really important. I think especially in our world because everything's changing so fast, right? Like social media. Right, just kind of scrolling, 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 reading, reading a couple, you know, liking, liking things that you don't even have time to read, <laughs> right? You're just, you're just going through it so fast, and the, all these images, everything's going so fast, and 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 your mind's going, your mind's going so fast that that I think that's why sometimes it's hard to stop and think about one thing for longer than five minutes. You know what I mean? And, and I struggle with this sometimes, even, even when I'm preparing a Bible study, when I'm preparing a sermon. Sometimes my mind's going a million different places. You can pray for me just for focus, right? And sometimes, I, so, so, but we need to focus on things. But, but here's, here's this study that I ran across. I think this was a study that Barna did. Um, actually, I think I've got it here that I can look at it. Um, it was a study um, about why. Yeah, I think it's here. Let me see. Yeah, okay. Uh, the cause for America's moral decline. Does anybody disagree that there's a moral decline happening in America? Does anybody think we're doing, we're getting way better? Right. I think we're all in agreement that there's a, a moral decline. I ran across a fascinating study about the reasons for the moral decline. So this is a study that Barna did, and, and I'm going to read uh, five different reasons for America's moral decline. And don't, don't say anything, but just in your mind, you pick which one of these reasons you think is the, the most uh, significant reason for America's moral decline. Uh, number one, lack of positive parental involvement. Number two, negative influence of the media. Number three, unhealthy reliance on social media for current events. Uh, number four, low level of respect for the Bible as a moral guide. And number five, negative influence of government leaders. Okay, you got those? I'll read them again. Lack of positive parental involvement negative influence of media, unhealthy reliance on social media for current events, low level of respect for the Bible as a moral guide, negative influence of government leaders. Okay, so here's the thing. Let's see here. Levi, you're back there. I'm going to try to, try to uh, airdrop this to you. Sorry, I've never done this in the middle of a message before. Okay, so he can throw that up on the screen. This, this wasn't planned, but, but it, it came to me as we're thinking about this, setting our hearts on things above. Okay, before you put it on the screen, don't put it on the screen yet. Uh, uh, so what's interesting about the results of the survey is that, that they divided people into different groups. Uh, let me get back to this so I can look at it. Oh, dear. Okay. Whoop. Ah, rats. There we go. Okay. So they divided people into groups. Gen Z, millennials, 
Gen X, boomers, and elders. So elders are 70 plus. Uh, boomers, I, I, don't, I, don't have the, the, uh, I don't have the ages here. Gen Z, millennials, and Gen X, right? So Gen Z is basically like my daughter, like 18, like that, that great. Millennials, I think, are in their, how, does anybody know this? Millennials are like, what, in their 20s now, 30s? 30s, millennials are in their 30s. Gen X is more like 40s. No, 50s. Nobody knows. Okay. All right. What's fascinating to me, when you say the cause for America's moral decline, uh, the, the number, if you look at the Gen X, which is me, okay, I'm in my, I'm 55. All right. I know I look like I'm 30. Thank you. But, <laughs> but I'm not. I'm, so I'm Gen X, right? So, um, the lack of positive parental involvement is the number one reason for the cause of America's moral decline, according to Gen X. Now, when you go to Gen Z, which is, are the youngest ones, and who's most involved with social media? Gen Z, right? The youngest ones. They say the cause for America's moral decline is the negative influence of media. And they're the ones most engaged with the media. You can throw that up there whenever you, whenever you get it. Did you get it? Oh, okay. That's all right. Uh, if, if you want it, uh, email me and I'll send it to you. Uh, so the, so the, the, the youngest people that were surveyed say that the reason that America's moral decline is happening is because of the negative influence of media, which I found absolutely fascinating. Um, all right. And so, so here then, um, if you're on media so often, how can you set your mind on things above? Do you know what I mean? Because, because, because there's so many images coming on your mind and so many headlines that are coming at you so fast every two seconds. A anytime you watch a movie or a TV show, count how many times the camera angle changes. Right? Like it's, and it will, it will change probably every one to three seconds, right? It's a different camera angle. So, so this is conditioning us. So this verse is so important. Since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So this passage tells us, don't set your minds on earthly things. All right, let's keep going. Uh, put to death, therefore, oh, verse 4, when Christ, who's your life, appears, who is your life. Christ is your life. When he appears, you will appear with him in glory. Hallelujah. Put to death. So because of this, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, put it to death. Impurity, put it to death. Lust, evil desires, greed, idolatry, put it all to death. The wrath of God's coming because of these things. You used to walk this way, but now you must rid yourselves of all these things. So rid yourselves of lust. Rid yourselves of evil desires. Rid yourselves of greed. Rid yourselves of anger, of malice, of rage, of slander, of filthy language from your lips. There used to be, uh, oh, there you got it. That's probably really hard to see. Um, <laughs> all that effort, but that's all right. Um, yeah, if you want to just crop the, the top two sections of that graph, that'll help them. Just crop the, the top two and then make that bigger, give you something to do while I teach the Bible. Um, um, yeah, you know, so, so it says here that, that, um, that we should get rid of filthy language from our lips. And yet, how long ago was it that it was very popular for pastors to cuss? You know, there was like, do you remember uh, a long time ago, there was a, if I mentioned his name, you'd probably recognize him, but he would use like expletives from, from the pulpit. And, and uh, it just, I, I never really got that. <laughs> I feel like, why, why are you using filthy language when the Bible says you should get rid of filthy language from your lips? And he'd drink beer and all that stuff. It's like, I don't, it was, yeah. If 
well. And then, and then verse 9, do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Here there's no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. Th this should be your character right here. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. I'm reading it slowly so it'll sink in. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, such as members of one body you were called to peace. I want to make a quick comment about this. This word rule is a word that is the same word that's used for an umpire to rule, whether it's a strike or a ball. So, it's, we tend to think let the peace of Christ rule as sitting on a throne, right? And, and being, being uh, uh, the, 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 the dominant force. Um, this has been very helpful for me in decision making because it says let the peace of Christ act as an umpire in your life. In other words, when you're thinking about option A or option B, do you have peace? If you, if you forecast option A out, would that bring peace into your life, the peace of Christ? If you forecast option B, does that, do, you, do you see that as a peaceful option, right? And so let the peace of Christ act as an umpire in your life, in your decision making. It's, it's been very helpful for me. Uh, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Again, memorizing scripture, even if you memorize one or two verses that you are just your go-to verses, let them dwell. As you teach and admonish one another, isn't that interesting? Paul wasn't the only one teaching. He was telling the people in the church, teach one another. Teach one another. Admonish each other. If you see somebody caught in sin, you go to them. If you, if you, if you need, see somebody that needs correction, you go to them. And, and, and you go with all wisdom as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. You should be singing. Now, maybe, you're, you don't, maybe you shouldn't be singing up here on a microphone, but you should be singing. When you drive in the car, just worship the Lord. Make up a song. Just let it fly. Sing as loud as you want, depending on who's with you. And, uh, and verse 17, whatever you do, Whatever you do, whether in word, the things you say, or deed, your actions, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Oh, this is so good. All right, verse 18. Uh, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Love that verse. Such a good verse. <laughs> I know you love it too. It's a great verse. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. You know, as a dad, I have three kids and, and I am, I am uh, um, uh, especially when my children were little, I was very aware of the power of, that a father has in the life of their children. It's, it's almost frightening, right, to, to be a steward of this power that you have over another human being. And so, so we have to treat our children with, with respect and with honor, not as Ephesians says, don't provoke them. Uh, and that, that, so these were just so helpful verses to me, especially when my kids were younger, not to provoke them, uh, but to bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Uh, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. Do it not only when their eye is on you to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Uh, we, could, we could look at this as employ, employees to employers. Uh, whatever you do, verse 23, work at it with all your heart. That's effort. I think that Christians are some of the best or should be some of the best employees working with all your heart. 
not for your boss, but for the Lord. Since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. Isn't that great? Not only do you get a paycheck, but you get something from the Lord. That's great, right? Some of you are like, whoo, I'm glad for that because my <laughs> paycheck doesn't go very far these days. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Do you see the preeminence of Christ all through this? Christ in you. Christ, it, you, you are living for Christ. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for wrong. There's no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with letters right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Uh, verse 2, chapter 4, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful, thankful. Pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery. Several times he uses this word mystery here, the mystery of Christ for which I'm in chains. So Paul was in prison for his faith. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. What a, what a, great, what a great passage here. All right, and then uh, he mentions a bunch of names here that he knew there in uh, Colossae. Um, Tychicus will tell you all, all the news about me. He's a dear brother, faithful minister, fellow servant. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage you, encourage your hearts. He's coming with Onesimus, uh, our faithful and dear brother who is one of you. You may recognize the name Onesimus. That's also in the book of Philemon. Uh, they will tell you everything that's happening here. Verse 10, my fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You've received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. So you see uh, Mark and Paul had a bit of a separation, but they are in the process of being reconciled here. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. They are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. They've proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, we already met Epaphras. Uh, he is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God. So Epaphras was praying, God, please help them to stand firm in your will. Mature. Help them to be mature. Fully assured. I vouch for him. He's working hard for you. Verse 14, our dear friend Luke the doctor and Demas sends greeting. We know that Demas uh, left Paul later, probably left the faith as well. Uh, verse 15, give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church at our house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans. Again, they were close. And that you, in turn, read the letter from Laodicea. Isn't that interesting? There's another letter that Paul wrote. It's not in the Bible. I wish we could read it someday. Maybe we will when we get to heaven. Then uh, this verse here, which I think has encouraged many a Christian. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you've received in the Lord. Complete it. Whatever you started, complete it. God's called you to do it. Press on and do it. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. So if you want to know Christ, read the book of Colossians, which we just did tonight. I believe that we are closer to Jesus now than we were an hour ago. I believe because of Colossians, we are walking with Christ in a more intimate way. And uh, hopefully there's some verses in there that you can commit to memory that you can use to uh, help you in your life to walk closer with Christ. But uh, Colossians, such a fantastic book. I like these kind of shorter books because we can go a bit into, into more detail. So, Father, thank you for the book of Colossians. I can't wait to meet the Colossian believers when we get to heaven. And, Lord, I, I do pray that you would I pray for our prayer lives, Lord. We want to... Uh, I, Epaphras seems to be such a man of prayer, laboring fervently. And uh, just a great prayer in chapter 1, to, to know the will of God and to walk in it. Lord, we do love you. May you be preeminent in our life. Jesus, may you receive all the glory and the attention in our lives. Lord, for your glory, we live and move and have our being. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen.